So please join me in welcoming Dr. Becca Dickstein. Thank you all for coming. So without further ado, there's my title again. Um, and we're going to be talking about legumes, and we're specifically going to be talking about those. But before we do, I want to tell you about nitrogen and why anybody would want to worry about nitrogen. So from the standpoint of plant productivity, um, photosynthesis is probably the most important biochemical process on the planet, because that's how carbon gets into the food chain. Um, nitrogen fixation is second in importance, because that's how nitrogen gets into the food chain. Um, and nitrogen is important um, for making protein and nucleic acids and a lot of other biomolecules. Um, so the atmosphere, every breath you take, 78% nitrogen. But that nitrogen is not bioavailable to us. Um, and it's not bioavailable to plants unless it's fixed. So plant, you can see plants that have bioavailable nitrogen. Here's rice. There's the nitrogen. Here's soybean. You can see very clearly which has been, um, which has bioavailable nitrogen in it because it's greener. So um, nitrogen enters the environment three ways, OK? We have lightning that accounts for a small percent of nitrogen entering the biosphere, biological nitrogen fixation, and from an agricultural standpoint, legumes and symbiotic nitrogen fixation are the most important, and then synthetic fertilizers. So this has been around for, well, since the planet began. This has been around uh, for 50 to 60 million years. And this has been around for about 100 years. And it's had a tremendous impact on agriculture. But before we go into that, I want to just talk about uh, legumes and what they are. So you know legumes as your bean plants, as your pea plants. Um, they're the third largest family of plants. Um, on the planet after sunflower and orchids. Um, and they're um, important for human and animal nutrition. About 25% of the world's crop production is in legumes. Um, they're important for forage. So alfalfa is the fourth largest crop in the United States. They're important for landscapes. Think vetch and Texas blue bonnets. Those are legumes. And there are, there are important trees as well. And here's a nice image of beans that you know we all eat. Um, so legumes um, are the basis of the oldest crop rotation that's known. Um, so legumes have been known for a very long time to enrich the soil for nitrogen. The uh, Native Americans knew about it. They knew about you know the three sisters that are grown together with uh, beans. Uh, those are the legumes, maize and squash, the beans providing nitrogen. So they improve the soil via symbiotic nitrogen fixation. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about this synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So um, this is Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch. And a little bit more than 100 years ago, Fritz Haber figured out how to chemically Re reduce nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, under pretty extreme conditions to ammonia. And Carl Bosch figured out how to industrialize this and, and bulk it up, make a lot of it. Subsequently, the population was expanding, and um, Norman Borlaug uh, used nitrogen fertilizer and used this uh, important resource, along with phosphorus fertilizer, um, in the Green Revolution to breed plants with high yields. And um, so what we see right here is a trajectory of the usage of um, uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So if we fast forward to the present, what we see is that about half the people on the planet are supported by 
industrial nitrogen fixation, which is a lot. So this has been a huge boon to mankind. It's, it's uh, prevented mass starvation, and I think none of us can um, really um, underestimate the impact that this, has, this innovation has had on our food supply. With the increased um, use of fertilizer, well, it comes in a number of different forms. So it comes as ammonia or nitrate, urea, um, organic nitrogen. Uh, some of this comes from animal waste. But all of this mostly comes um, from fertilizer. Um, so it's, there's been this huge increase in crop productivity, but nitrogen has some pretty serious environmental and handling problems that are associated with it. So first, you know, all those, the, the extreme conditions that it takes to crack nitrogen, well, those consume a lot of energy, so energy prices raise and fall. They go up and down um, together with petrochemical costs. So about 2%, which is kind of cheap, of the petrochemical um, uh, fuel budget gets used for um, cracking nitrogen for farmers. All that energy in, though, you can imagine that energy is, is being stored in fertilizers, and that makes fertilizers um, pretty um, explosive. This was a big explosion that happened in 1947 in Texas that killed uh, hundreds of people and um, also injured thousands, and more recently, um, we've had the deliberate bombing in Oklahoma City. That was a, um, a, an ammonium nitrate bomb. And even more recently, we had the explosion in West Texas. Um, so the handling's a problem. Um, but these are unusual cases. Um, routine problems include the production of greenhouse gases. So nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas. It's estimated to be about um, 100-fold more potent than carbon dioxide. And other reactive uh, nitrogen species also um, contribute to global warming. Um, there's also runoff, which is a huge problem. And the last one of these smart talks um, featured Aaron Roberts, who talked about the uh, Deepwater Horizon explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. And up until that happened, the biggest prob pollution problem in the Gulf of Mexico is this dead zone that occurs every year. It's um, between uh, usually about five to 8,000 square miles. Um, there's also been some dead zones um, in the um, upper Midwest caused by um, nitrogen fertilizer and also fertilizer that we use on our lawns. So it's not just agriculture that contributes this. And this is because um, these nitrate especially, is, it's very mobile and it moves in the soil. So not the plants don't take it all up. So what this looks like on the ground, this is a, an image uh, from Science Magazine this year showing um, the uh, eutrophication in Lake Erie. And um, here's an image from the Gulf of Mexico. So what about legumes? And why do I study legumes? Um, le I study legumes because they get nitrogen into the biosphere um, in a much more sustainable way. Like I said, this was known to the ancient Greeks. It was known to Native Americans. So there's probably ways we can harness this as well um, to understand it. Legumes fix nitrogen in association with bacteria that live in the soil. And our other um, important crops don't do this. So our, all of our cereal crops are big calorie crops, um, corn, rice, wheat. Um, they don't do this. Um, so that makes legumes really special. 
So biological nitrogen fi fixation, the legume, rhizobia. So I'm going to say this word, rhizobia, a few times. These are specialized soil bacteria. They're actually the nitrogen fixers. So this is much more sustainable than the Haber-Bosch process. And legumes are also, they're sustainable crops. So in purple here are legumes and their current amount of greenhouse gas emissions compared to 2050 cropland use, water use, nitrogen use, none, um, and phosphorus use, not a lot. So what you can see here is they're among the most sustainable crops. This was published last year in Nature, and you may have read about this uh, study. It was widely cited um, by major news organizations saying, eat more beans. Um, so, how does this work? Well, the plant supports the rhizobia. It's the rhizobia that fix the nitrogen. And here we have a metacago plant. It's the plant I study um, growing with cyanorhizobium. There's no nitrogen source in these um, auger slants. And there it is without cyanorhizobium. So, so you can see the huge impact. And the action takes place in these new organs on the roots called nodules. So um, it's known, we know, that genes from both the plant and the bacterial partner are required to make the nodule and make it work properly, even though it's the bacteria that carry out symbiotic nitrogen fixation. And in my lab, we're working on the plant part what its contribution is. So you're going to be seeing a lot of uh, plants in this, in this talk, images of plants where they're kind of wimpy. Those are the mutants that we're studying. So this is a mutant that is fixed minus. It has the little nodules on them, but it doesn't fix nitrogen. So it's got this nitrogen deficiency phenotype. You can see the leaves are a little purple, and it's wimpy. So um, we know that rhizobia that are in the soil, this is an incredible symbiosis. I mean, a really incredible symbiosis. Bacteria that are in the soil, originally in the soil, um, have a communication with cells on the outside. So what we see here is the bacteria in red. Over here, this is a micrograph with bacteria for which you can stain blue to see where they are. Uh, they undergo a communication, genes are activated, the plant makes a tube for them, an intracellular tube, and brings them down across a number of cell layers to newly divided cells in the cortex of the root. And this is metacago right here. This is about the width of an alfalfa sprout. So you've all had alfalfa sprouts, right? Okay. So it brings the bacteria down to them. And here's a cartoon. Once the bacteria get brought down, they are released um, into the cell. They're invaginated, and they live inside the cell cytoplasm like an acquired organelle. And here you can see a micrograph of this happening. Can you see that little rhizobia being pinched off? Okay, so they then butt off and live like an acquired organelle. So they're surrounded by a special membrane that the plant makes for them um, and a space. And they come to fill um, the cells that, that hold them. And you, here you can see a micrograph of this the, with the cytosol just packed with rhizobia. And in the legume that I study, metacago, it makes indeterminate nodules. And you can see a light micrograph here and a confocal micrograph here. And you can see that there is a cline of development, a gradient of development um, from the top, where the cells are really small, to um, the nitrogen fixing zone which is where the bacteria and the cells that contain them have both blown up, okay? They're huge cells. 
So um, one of the research focus foci in my lab is to understand the genes that contribute to this process from the plant's perspective and to identify the genes and then try to understand what it is they're doing in the plant um, to support this process. And the long-term um, goal is if we understand this, we might be able to somehow improve it or even transfer it to the cereal crops that uh, currently don't fix nitrogen. So long-range goals. We're, we're working on the in-depth understanding. And I work with this um, organism, Metacago truncatula. I know it's a handful. It's a legume model. It's like it's the uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly of the legume family. Okay. Um, it's a relative of alfalfa, which is Metacago sativa. And we work on it because it's well behaved genetically, and we have a ton of wonderful. Um, new molecular tools, including a genome now, that enable us to work with it. With it. And we work with two different um, genotypes of it, A17 and R108. So first I'm going to tell you about some genetic work we did in A17. So we used um, a mutagenized population. It was mutagenized with a chemical that makes hundreds to thousands of different mutations in, um, in the plant. And we're, the goal of our research is to find mutants and then figure out which gene is responsible. That's our first aim. So that's outlined here. Identify the mutants, find the mutated gene, and then functionally characterize it. So this is one of the first mutants we looked at. We called it NIP for numerous infections with polyphenolics. That describes the phenotype. And what you can see here, it's now called NPF 1.7 for reasons I'm not going to go into. Uh, what you can see here, here's wild type. There's the mutant. The roots are shorter. There you can see the wild type nodule. You can see that the mutant makes puny nodules. The mutant plants are also puny. We got very excited about this because here's the infection threads here, which are green. Uh, this green dye stains nucleic acids. And, and, the, and you can see that the rhizobia get stuck in. They can't get out. It's, they're really defective nodules. And it also had a lateral root defect. So after a lot of work, we didn't have the genome back then. We were, our community was still um, assembling the genome. We had to do a genome walk. We were able to clone the gene, which we did. And this just is the uh, proof, one of the proofs that we cloned it. So there's the mutant, and there's the wild type, and this is when the mutant, when we put the wild type gene back in, and it complements, it restored function. So this was among the pieces of evidence that we really had it. And this was a collaborative effort that my lab um, led that actually involved uh, three other labs. Um, and we got the cover of Plant Journal when we cloned it. And we were very excited to see that the gene was expressed in uh, parts of the, of the nodule and lateral root that looked especially wimpy. Um, and this is a construct where we took the controlling element of the gene and fused it to a reporter so we could see where it's expressed in the tips of the nodule and also of the primary root and the lateral roots. And this is a similar experiment but done with a different um, uh, visible marker right here. So. Um, we next turned our attention to what does this do. Um, and we, uh, it looked like it maybe was a transporter. And we discovered um, by putting it into frog eggs that once it was there, it transported nitrate. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it is a proton-coupled high-affinity nitrate transporter in oocytes. And we then ask the question, is it also, does, does it do that in um, plants? So we got a nitrate transporter mutant. Um, it lacks this nitrate transporter that brings nitrate into the plant. Um, and it has these kind of kinetics right here. This is what the wild type looks like right here. Um, and um, we found that when we put the NIP NPF 1.7 gene into it, it restored um, nitrate acquisition at low concentrations and leveled off at high concentrations. So that was satisfying in some ways. We can rationalize uh, that parts of the growing nodule are going to need nitrate. They're going to need a nitrogen source before the nitrogen gets turned on. I'm going to turn to some other uh, mutants that we're working on in our lab. Um, and these are in this different ecotype. And they are uh, caused by a jumping gene. And if I use the word transposon, that just means jumping gene. And uh, these mutations are much easier to find than these kind over here. And that's because when this jumping gene jumps into a gene, it disrupts it and it marks it. So we can find all the marked places in the genome and thus, uh, in principle anyway, get all of the mutants um, that exist there. Um, at the Noble Foundation, which is now the Noble Research Institute in Ardmore, Oklahoma, scientists, including Rick Dixon, who is now here at UNT, um, had the foresight to ex massively expand this population uh, there are now about 22,000 lines, and the Medicago community has been going up, uh, for us, it's up to Ardmore, um, once a year to do a community screen. Um, and with the community screen, um, there is also a database that contains um, some of the insert locations in each of the lines separated from each other. So that gives us a tremendous resource. So here at UNT, we are um, taking mutants from this line and then we are rescreening them for whether or not they're defective in uh, symbiotic nitrogen fixation. And in our lab, if anybody's been around on the third floor, you can, you've seen us rolling around these large garbage cans, right? Anybody seen that? Um, well, they've got, we've made these custom lids. We grow our plants in a mist. It's a whole lot easier to look at the roots at uh, different stages of development um, if they're not in dirt, especially because we're looking for weeny little nodules. And um, it's also from the, the top, from the lids, you can clearly see which of the mutants. You see those right there, the fixed minus mutants? They have the phenotype. And there's also a few mutants that are tucked in around these wild types. And so we phenotype for nitrogen deficiency symptoms. And then uh, we look at the nodule phenotype. So here we look at the plant mutotype. There's a puny one. And then we look, this is wild type nodules at uh, 15 days uh, after we uh, put the bacteria in with them. And then we get mutants, and some of them have little bumps, some of them have bigger bumps, and some of them have brown bumps. And we stain them. We take them, slice them, and then stain them uh, with blue dye so that we can see what the rhizobial occupancy looks like, because this blue dye stains for where the bacteria are. And um, when we started this project, um, we uh, got really frustrated pretty quickly with the coverage of the um, inserts. 
the insert locations in the database, um, we, we found that it was um, inefficient. And so we got so frustrated, we just decided, OK, we're just going to do whole genome sequencing. And we did this uh, for two lines, and we got, we're so happy with the results, we then did it for seven more. And for those of you who are sequencing geeks, you can read um, you know, the, the data that we got. Um, we got enough coverage. And this was a collaboration with uh, Rajiv Asad's group. Um, this was our strategy to look for where the um, inserts were. We looked first uh, in our bioinformatics data for where's the TNT, and then we had a strategy to find the DNA that was next to it, and that defined the position of the insert. Pretty simple. Um, and so we immediately identified the causative mutations in two different lines, and I'll show you what they are. They're these lines. With these numbers, you can see one of them had brown nodules, one of them had blue nodules, and their occupancy was lower than wild type. So um, one of them um, encodes a protein known as DNF2 that looks like uh, it either cleaves a lipid or a lipid anchor attached to a protein. And the second one, um, was, is a uh, transcription factor, and this is, uh, it encodes a protein that turns on other genes. That's what a transcription factor is. Um, we've identified probable causative mutations in four other lines, um, and we've confirmed these by using the database. See, that's the beauty of this population. We go back to the database, and we say, OK, can we find another plant that has an insertion in this gene? And then we get the, we get the uh, plants, and we test them. And uh, that gives us a putative new allele, which is just a fancy way of saying we're confirming that it's that mutation and not one of the other 100 in the line or 25 in the line. Um, we also have discovered that some of the plants in our population have other mutations in them. We know this for a case for this one where we know that we have, the mutation is not in that particular line. It's somewhere in a genetic interval. And we have still two lines in which we don't even have an interval. So those continue to be worked on. Meanwhile, we've also been working on um, some tools to try to make this whole process of grabbing the genes in the mutants better. Um, and we're, we're taking a page out of the human genome uh, project and using a technique called sequence capture. And we'll pull out the, uh, tr the jumping gene and the adjacent DNA. And our first. Um, test for this was using the lines that we had uh, sequenced because uh, that allowed us to compare uh, the inserts that we got via the new technique versus the old technique. This was just published. And you can see that the numbers are comparable. We still don't have all the bioinformatics worked out on this, but we're getting there. So. Um, you didn't come here to hear my dreams, but I do have dreams. I dream that maybe uh, one day we'll have bitter, bigger and better legumes, or maybe one day we'll have uh, nitrogen-fixing corn, corn that can form the symbiosis with rhizobia and get their, get those corn plants might be able to get their nitrogen not from synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And along these lines, I'm just going to show you one other thing that we've done in my lab. And this was not intended at all. Um, it happened. Uh, we were doing an experiment to find out we, with the first gene I showed you, that NIP NPF gene, what would happen if we gave the plant too much of it. So we overexpressed it. Um, we knew what it looked like when it had none. It was mutant. And to our big surprise, the plants were bigger. Um, 
And uh, Jing Akai, who's a graduate student in the lab, was able to show that they also were able to fix more nitrogen. And uh, so we have a patent on this. And we're also using it to try to understand how the gene works. So in summary, um, industrial nitrogen fertilizer has been a huge benefit to mankind. Um, but it also has a high environmental cost. Um, legumes provide an alt alternative way to get nitrogen into uh, uh, the environment and the food chain. Understanding symbiotic nitrogen fixation uh, may allow its improvement and expansion to other plants. It requires genes and proteins and mechanisms from both organisms. And uh, our work on forward genetics, uh, coupled with some next-gen tools, um, molecular biology and biochemistry, is revealing the identity of genes that are essential to this process. And um, we hope contributing to the greater good. Um, so what can you do if you're concerned about nitrogen in the environment? One, you can eat more beans and peas. Um, you know, they're a great source of protein. Um, Plant more legumes in your landscapes. Everybody's looking at the beautiful blue bonnets right now. Those are legumes. And think before you use nitrogen fertilizer or phosphorus fertilizer. So I'd like to close uh, with um, thanking uh, students from my lab. I think I saw all four of you, uh, all four of the PH students uh, for all four of the PhD students come in, uh, Jing Akai, Derej Dakwal, Rajasri Pradhan, Yao Chan Yu, and um, Elena Shuleyev uh, is a part-time technician. I've been ably assisted, and they've been ably assisted by um, many undergraduate research assistants. These are uh, former students and a postdoc who've left. These are some of my collaborators uh, here at UNT. There are others who are not mentioned. Um, this is our Medicago team. Um, uh, Dr. Gao mentioned um, a big collaborative grant, and there are seven of us on this, on this grant, funding from the National Science Foundation. I'd also um, like to thank um, doctors uh, Gao, Padilla, and Verbeck for, and Courtney Marie McCready for listening to me when I rehearsed this, because I haven't given a talk to a general audience on my work before. Uh, so I want to thank them for uh, the rehearsals. And I also want to thank Courtney Marie McCready for all the logistics support. Thank you very much. And lastly, I want to thank my husband, Lon Turnbull, who's put up with uh, late nights and work on the weekends. And um, he's just generally a great guy. Anyway, thanks, Lon.